Part 2 Chapter 1 Right after my arrest, I was questioned several times. But it was just so they could find out who I was, which didn't take long. The first time at the police station, nobody seemed very interested in my case. A week later, however, the examining magistrate looked me over with curiosity. But to get things started, he simply asked my name and address, my occupation, the date and place of my birth. Then he wanted to know if I had hired an attorney. I admitted I hadn't and inquired whether it was really necessary to have one. Why do you ask, he said. I said, I thought my case was pretty simple. He smiled and said, that's your opinion, but the law is the law. If you don't hire an attorney yourself, the court will appoint one. I thought it was very convenient that the court should take care of those details. I told him so. He agreed with me and concluded that it was a good law. At first, I didn't take him seriously. I was led into a curtained room. There was a single lamp on his desk, which was shining on a chair where he had me sit while he remained standing in the shadows. I had read descriptions of scenes like this in books, and it all seemed like a game to me. After our conversation, though, I looked at him and saw a tall, fine-featured man with deep-set blue eyes, a long gray mustache, and lots of thick, almost white hair. He struck me as being very reasonable, and overall quite pleasant, despite a nervous tick which made his mouth twitch now and then. On my way out, I was even going to shake his hand, but just in time, I remembered that I had killed a man. The next day, a lawyer came to see me at the prison. He was short and chubby, quite young, his hair carefully slicked back. Despite the heat, I was in my shirt sleeves. He had on a dark suit, a wing collar, and an odd-looking tie with broad black and white stripes. He put the briefcase he was carrying down on my bed, introduced himself, and said he had gone over my file. My case was a tricky one, but he had no doubts we'd win, if I trusted him. I thanked him, and he said, Let's get down to business. He sat down on the bed and explained to me that there had been some investigations into my private life. It had been learned that my mother had died recently at the home, Inquiries had then been made in Marengo. The investigators had learned that I had shown insensitivity the day of Maman's funeral. You understand, my lawyer said, it's a little embarrassing for me to have to ask you this, but it's very important, and it will be a strong argument for the prosecution if I can't come up with some answers. He wanted me to help him. He asked if I had felt any sadness that day. The question caught me by surprise, and it seemed to me that I would have been very embarrassed if I'd had to ask it. Nevertheless, I answered that I had pretty much lost the habit of analyzing myself, and that it was hard for me to tell him what he wanted to know. I probably did love Maman, but that didn't mean anything. At one time or another, all normal people have wished their loved ones were dead. Here, the lawyer interrupted me, and he seemed very upset. He made me promise I wouldn't say that at my hearing or in front of the examining magistrate. I explained to him, however, that my nature was such that my physical needs often got in the way of my feelings. The day I buried Maman, I was very tired and sleepy, so much so that I wasn't really aware of what was going on. What I can say for certain is that I would rather Maman hadn't died. But my lawyer didn't seem satisfied. He said, that's not enough. He thought for a minute. He asked me if he could say that that day I had held back my natural feelings. I said no, because it's not true. He gave me a strange look, as if he found me slightly disgusting. He told me in an almost snide way that in any case, the director and the staff of the home would be called as witnesses and that things could get very nasty for me. I pointed out to him that none of this had anything to do with my case, but all he said was that it was obvious I had never had any dealings with the law. He left looking angry. 
I wished I could have made him stay, to explain that I wanted things between us to be good. Not so he'd defend me better, but, if I can put it this way, good in a natural way. Mostly I could tell I made him feel uncomfortable. He didn't understand me, and he was sort of holding it against me. I felt the urge to reassure him that I was like everybody else, just like everybody else. But really, there wasn't much point, and I gave up the idea out of laziness. Shortly after that, I was taken before the examining magistrate again. It was two o'clock in the afternoon, and this time his office was filled with sunlight, barely softened by a flimsy curtain. It was very hot. He had me sit down and very politely informed me that, due to unforeseen circumstances, my lawyer had been unable to come. But I had the right to remain silent and to wait for my lawyer's counsel. I said that I could answer for myself. He pressed a button on the table. A young clerk came in and sat down right behind me. The two of us leaned back in our chairs. The examination began. He started out by saying that people were describing me as a taciturn and withdrawn person, and he wanted to know what I thought. I answered, it's just that I don't have much to say, so I keep quiet. He smiled the way he had the first time, agreed that that was the best reason of all, and added, besides, it's not important. Then he looked at me without saying anything, leaned forward rather abruptly and said very quickly, What interests me is you. I didn't really understand what he meant by that, so I didn't respond. There are one or two things, he added, that I don't quite understand. I'm sure you'll help me clear them up. I said it was all pretty simple. He pressed me to go back over that day. I went back over what I had already told him. Raymond, the beach, the swim, the quarrel, then back to the beach, the little spring, the sun, and the five shots from the revolver. After each sentence, he would say, fine, fine. When I got to the body lying there, he nodded and said, good. But I was tired of repeating the same story over and over. It seemed as if I had never talked so much in my life. After a short silence, he stood up and told me that he wanted to help me, that I interested him, and that, with God's help, he would do something for me. But first, he wanted to ask me a few more questions. Without working up to it, he asked if I loved Maman. I said yes, the same as anyone, and the clerk, who up to then had been typing steadily, must have hit the wrong key because he lost his place and had to go back. Again, without any apparent logic, the magistrate then asked if I had fired all five shots at once. I thought for a minute and explained that at first I had fired a single shot and then a few seconds later the other four. Then he said, Why did you pause between the first and second shot? Once again, I could see the red sand and feel the burning of the sun on my forehead. But this time I didn't answer. In the silence that followed, the magistrate seemed to be getting fidgety. He sat down, ran his fingers through his hair, put his elbows on his desk, and leaned toward me slightly with a strange look on his face. Why? Why did you shoot at a body that was on the ground? Once again, I didn't know how to answer. The magistrate ran his hands across his forehead and repeated his question with a slightly different tone in his voice. Why? You must tell me. Why? Still, I didn't say anything. Suddenly, he stood up, strode over to a far corner of his office, and pulled out a drawer in a file cabinet. He took out a silver crucifix, which he brandished as he came toward me. And in a completely different, almost cracked voice, he shouted, Do you know what this is? I said, Yes, of course. Speaking very quickly and passionately, he told me that he believed in God, that it was his conviction that no man was so guilty that God would not forgive him. But in order for that to happen, a man must repent, and in so doing become like a child whose heart is open and ready to embrace all. He was leaning all the way over the table, 
He was waving his crucifix almost directly over my head. To tell the truth, I had found it very hard to follow his reasoning, first because I was hot and there were big flies in his office that kept landing on my face, and also because he was scaring me a little. At the same time, I knew that that was ridiculous because, after all, I was the criminal. He went on anyway. I vaguely understood that to his mind there was just one thing that wasn't clear in my confession, the fact that I had hesitated before I fired my second shot. The rest was fine, but that part he couldn't understand. I was about to tell him he was wrong to dwell on it, because it really didn't matter. But he cut me off and urged me one last time, drawing himself up to his full height and asking me if I believed in God. I said no. He sat down indignantly. He said it was impossible. All men believed in God, even those who turned their backs on him. That was his belief, and if he were ever to doubt it, his life would become meaningless. Do you want my life to be meaningless, he shouted. As far as I could see, it didn't have anything to do with me, and I told him so. But from across the table, he had already thrust the crucifix in my face and was screaming irrationally. I am a Christian. I ask him to forgive you your sins. How can you not believe that he suffered for you? I was struck by how sincere he seemed, but I had had enough. It was getting hotter and hotter. As always, whenever I want to get rid of someone I'm not really listening to, I made it appear as if I agreed. To my surprise, he acted triumphant. You see? You see? he said. You do believe, don't you? And you're going to place your trust in him, aren't you? Obviously, I again said no. He fell back in his chair. He seemed to be very tired. He didn't say anything for a minute, while the typewriter, which hadn't let up the whole time, was still tapping out the last few sentences. Then he looked at me closely, and with a little sadness in his face. In a low voice, he said, I have never seen a soul as hardened as yours. The criminals who have come before me have always wept at the sight of this image of suffering. I was about to say that that was precisely because they were criminals. But then I realized that I was one too. It was an idea I couldn't get used to. Then the judge stood up, as if to give me the signal that the examination was over. He simply asked, in the same weary tone, if I was sorry for what I had done. I thought about it for a minute, and said that more than sorry, I felt kind of annoyed. I got the impression he didn't understand. But that was as far as things went that day. After that I saw a lot of the magistrate except that my lawyer was with me each time. But it was just a matter of clarifying certain things in my previous statements, or else the magistrate would discuss the charges with my lawyer. But on those occasions, they never really paid much attention to me. Anyway, the tone of the questioning gradually changed. The magistrate seemed to have lost interest in me, and to have come to some sort of decision about my case. He didn't talk to me about God anymore and I never saw him as worked up as he was that first day. The result was that our discussions became more cordial. A few questions, a brief conversation with my lawyer, and the examinations were over. As the magistrate put it, my case was taking its course. And then sometimes, when the conversation was of a more general nature, I would be included. I started to breathe more freely, no one in any of these meetings was rough with me. Everything was so natural, so well handled, and so calmly acted out that I had the ridiculous impression of being one of the family. And I can say that at the end of the eleven months that this investigation lasted, I was almost surprised that I had ever enjoyed anything other than those rare moments when the judge would lead me to the door of his office, slap me on the shoulder, and say to me cordially, that's all for today, Monsieur Antichrist. I would then be handed back over to the police. Chapter 2 
There are some things I've never liked talking about. A few days after I entered prison, I realized that I wouldn't like talking about this part of my life. Later on, though, I no longer saw any point to my reluctance. In fact, I wasn't really in prison those first few days. I was sort of waiting for something to happen. It was only after Marie's first and last visit that it all started. From the day I got her letter, she told me she would no longer be allowed to come because she wasn't my wife. From that day on, I felt that I was at home in my cell and that my life was coming to a standstill there. The day of my arrest, I was first put in a room where there were already several other prisoners, most of them Arabs. They laughed when they saw me. Then they asked what I was in for. I said I'd killed an Arab and they were all silent. A few minutes later, it got dark. They showed me how to fix the mat I was supposed to sleep on. One end could be rolled up to make a pillow. All night I felt bugs crawling over my face. A few days later, I was put in a cell by myself, where I slept on wooden boards suspended from the wall. I had a bucket for a toilet and a tin wash basin. The prison was on the heights above the town, and through a small window I could see the sea. One day as I was gripping the bars, my face straining toward the light, a guard came in and told me I had a visitor. I thought it must be Marie. It was. To get to the visiting room, I went down a long corridor, then down some stairs, and finally another corridor. I walked into a very large room brightened by a huge bay window. The room was divided into three sections by two large grates that ran the length of the room. Between the two grates was a space of eight to ten meters, which separated the visitors from the prisoners. I spotted Marie, standing at the opposite end of the room with her striped dress and her sun-tanned face. On my side of the room, there were about ten prisoners, most of them Arabs. Marie was surrounded by Moorish women and found herself between two visitors, a little thin-lipped old woman dressed in black and a fat, bareheaded woman who was talking at the top of her voice and making lots of gestures. Because of the distance between the grates, the visitors and the prisoners were forced to speak very loud. When I walked in, the sound of the voices echoing off the room's high bare walls and the harsh light pouring out of the sky onto the windows and spilling into the room brought on a kind of dizziness. My cell was quieter and darker. It took me a few seconds to adjust. But eventually I could see each face clearly, distinctly in the bright light. I noticed there was a guard sitting at the far end of the passage between the two grates. Most of the Arab prisoners and their families had squatted down facing each other. They weren't shouting. Despite the commotion, they were managing to make themselves heard by talking in very low voices. Their subdued murmuring, coming from lower down, formed a kind of bass accompaniment to the conversations crossing above their heads. I took all this in very quickly as I made my way toward Marie. Already pressed up against the grate, she was smiling her best smile for me. I thought she looked very beautiful, but I didn't know how to tell her. Well, she called across to me. Well, here I am. Are you all right? Do you have everything you want? Yes, everything. We stopped talking, and Marie went on smiling. The fat woman yelled to the man next to me, her husband probably, a tall blonde guy with an honest face. It was the continuation of a conversation already underway. Jean wouldn't take him, she shouted as loudly as she could. Uh-huh, said the man. I told her you'd take him back when you get out, but she wouldn't take him. Then it was Marie's turn to shout, that Raymond sent his regards, and I said thanks. But my voice was drowned out by the man next to me who asked, Is he all right? His wife laughed and said, He's never been better. The man on my left, a small young man with delicate hands, wasn't saying anything. I noticed that he was across from the little old lady and that they were staring intently at each other. But I didn't have time to watch them any longer because Marie shouted to me that I had to have hope. I said yes. 
I was looking at her as she said it, and I wanted to squeeze her shoulders through her dress. I wanted to feel the thin material, and I didn't really know what else I had to hope for other than that. But that was probably what Marie meant, because she was still smiling. All I could see was the sparkle of her teeth and the little folds of her eyes. She shouted again, You'll get out and we'll get married. I answered, You think so? But it was mainly just to say something. Then, very quickly and still in a very loud voice, she said yes, that I would be acquitted and that we would go swimming again. But the other woman took her turn to shout and said that she had left a basket at the clerk's office. She was listing all the things she had put in it to make sure they were all there because they cost a lot of money. The young man and his mother were still staring at each other. The murmuring of the Arabs continued below us. Outside, the light seemed to surge up over the bay window. I was feeling a little sick, and I'd have liked to leave. The noise was getting painful. But on the other hand, I wanted to make the most of Marie's being there. I don't know how much time went by. Marie told me about her job, and she never stopped smiling. The murmuring, the shouting, and the conversations were crossing back and forth. The only oasis of silence was next to me where the small young man and the old woman were gazing at each other. One by one the Arabs were taken away. Almost everyone stopped talking as soon as the first one left. The little old woman moved closer to the bars, and at the same moment a guard motioned to her son. He said, Goodbye, Maman, and she reached between two bars to give him a long, slow little wave. She left just as another man came in, hat in hand, and took her place. Another prisoner was brought in, and they talked excitedly, but softly, because the room had once again grown quiet. They came for the man on my right, and his wife said to him, without lowering her voice, as if she hadn't noticed there was no need to shout anymore, Take care of yourself, and be careful. Then it was my turn. Marie threw me a kiss. I looked back before disappearing. She hadn't moved, and her face was still pressed against the bars with the same sad, forced smile on it. Shortly after that was when she wrote to me, and the things I've never liked talking about began. Anyway, I shouldn't exaggerate, and it was easier for me than for others. When I was first imprisoned, the hardest thing was that my thoughts were still those of a free man. For example, I would suddenly have the urge to be on a beach and to walk down to the water. As I imagined the sound of the first waves under my feet, my body entering the water and the sense of relief it would give me, all of a sudden I would feel just how closed in I was by the walls of my cell. But that only lasted a few months. Afterwards, my only thoughts were those of a prisoner. I waited for the daily walk, which I took in the courtyard, or for a visit from my lawyer. The rest of the time I managed pretty well. At the time, I often thought that if I had had to live in the trunk of a dead tree, with nothing to do but look up at the sky flowering overhead, little by little, I would have gotten used to it. I would have waited for birds to fly by or clouds to mingle, just as here I waited to see my lawyer's ties. And just as in another world, I used to wait patiently until Saturday to hold Marie's body in my arms. Now, as I think back on it, I wasn't in a hollow tree trunk. There were others worse off than me. Anyway, it was one of Maman's ideas, and she often repeated it, that after a while you could get used to anything. Besides, I usually didn't take things so far. The first months were hard, but in fact the effort I had to make helped pass the time. For example, I was tormented by my desire for a woman. It was only natural. I was young. I never thought specifically of Marie, but I thought so much about a woman, about women, about all the ones I had known, about all the circumstances in which I had enjoyed them, that my cell would be filled with their faces and crowded with my desires. In one sense it threw me off balance, but in another it killed time. I had ended up making friends with the head guard, 
who used to make the rounds with the kitchen hands at mealtime. He's the one who first talked to me about women. He told me it was the first thing the others complained about. I told him it was the same for me, and that I thought it was unfair treatment. But, he said, that's exactly why you're in prison. What do you mean that's why? Well, yes, freedom, that's why. They've taken away your freedom. I'd never thought about that. I agreed. It's true, I said. Otherwise, what would be the punishment? Right. You see, you understand these things. The rest of them don't. But they just end up doing it by themselves. The guard left after that. There were the cigarettes, too. When I entered prison, they took away my belt, my shoelaces, my tie, and everything I had in my pockets, my cigarettes in particular. Once I was in my cell, I asked to have them back, but I was told I wasn't allowed. The first few days were really rough. That may be the thing that was hardest for me. I would suck on chips of wood that I broke off my bed planks. I walked around nauseated all day long. I couldn't understand why they had taken them away when they didn't hurt anybody. Later on, I realized that that, too, was part of the punishment. But by then I had gotten used to not smoking, and it wasn't a punishment anymore. Apart from these annoyances, I wasn't too unhappy. Once again, the main problem was killing time. Eventually, once I learned how to remember things, I wasn't bored at all. Sometimes I would get to thinking about my room, and in my imagination, I would start at one corner and circle the room, mentally noting everything there was on the way. At first it didn't take long, but every time I started over it took a little longer. I would remember every piece of furniture, and on every piece of furniture every object, and of every object all the details, and of the details themselves, a flake, a crack, or a chipped edge, the color and the texture. At the same time I would try not to lose the thread of my inventory, to make a complete list so that after a few weeks I could spend hours just enumerating the things that were in my room. And the more I thought about it, the more I dug out of my memory things I had overlooked or forgotten. I realized then that a man who had lived only one day could easily live for a hundred years in prison. He would have enough memories to keep him from being bored. In a way, it was an advantage. Then there was sleep. At first, I didn't sleep well at night, and not at all during the day. Little by little, my nights got better, and I was able to sleep during the day, too. In fact, during the last few months, I've been sleeping 16 to 18 hours a day. That would leave me six hours to kill with meals, nature's call, my memories, and the story about the Czechoslovakian. Between my straw mattress and the bed planks, I had actually found an old scrap of newspaper— yellow and transparent, half stuck to the canvas. On it was a news story, the first part of which was missing, but which must have taken place in Czechoslovakia. A man had left a Czech village to seek his fortune. Twenty-five years later, and now rich, he had returned with a wife and child. His mother was running a hotel with his sister in the village where he'd been born. In order to surprise them, he had left his wife and child at another hotel and gone to see his mother, who didn't recognize him when he walked in. As a joke, he'd had the idea of taking a room. He had shown off his money. During the night, his mother and his sister had beaten him to death with a hammer in order to rob him and had thrown his body in the river. The next morning, the wife had come to the hotel and, without knowing it, gave away the traveler's identity. The mother hanged herself. The sister threw herself down a well. I must have read that story a thousand times. On the one hand, it wasn't very likely. On the other, it was perfectly natural. Anyway, I thought the traveler pretty much deserved what he got, and that you should never play games. So, with all the sleep, my memories, reading my crime story and the alternation of light and darkness, time passed.
Of course I had read that eventually you wind up losing track of time in prison, but it hadn't meant much to me when I'd read it. I hadn't understood how days could be both long and short at the same time. Long to live through, maybe, but so drawn out that they ended up flowing into one another. They lost their names. Only the words yesterday and tomorrow still had any meaning for me. One day when the guard told me that I'd been in for five months, I believed it, but I didn't understand it. For me it was one and the same unending day that was unfolding in my cell and the same thing I was trying to do. That day, after the guard had left, I looked at myself in my tin plate. My reflection seemed to remain serious even though I was trying to smile at it. I moved the plate around in front of me. I smiled and it still had the same sad, stern expression. It was near the end of the day, the time of day I don't like talking about. That nameless hour when the sounds of evening would rise up from every floor of the prison in a cortege of silence. I moved closer to the window, and in the last light of day I gazed at my reflection one more time. It was still serious. And what was surprising about that, since at that moment I was too? But at the same time, and for the first time in months, I distinctly heard the sound of my own voice. I recognized it as the same one that had been ringing in my ears for many long days, and I realized that all that time I had been talking to myself. Then I remembered what the nurse at Maman's funeral said. No, there was no way out, and no one can imagine what nights in prison are like. Chapter 3 but I can honestly say that the time from summer to summer went very quickly, and I knew as soon as the weather turned hot that something new was in store for me. My case was set down for the last session of the Court of Assizes, and that session was due to end sometime in June. The trial opened with the sun glaring outside. My lawyer had assured me that it wouldn't last more than two or three days. Besides, he had added, the court will be pressed for time. Yours isn't the most important case of the session. Right after you, there's a parasite coming up. They came for me at 7.30 in the morning, and I was driven to the courthouse in the prison van. The two policemen took me into a small room that smelled of darkness. We waited, seated near a door through which we could hear voices, shouts, chairs being dragged across the floor and a lot of commotion which made me think of those neighborhood fets when the hall is cleared for dancing after the concert. The policeman told me we had to wait for the judges, and one of them offered me a cigarette, which I turned down. Shortly after that he asked me if I had the jitters. I said no, and that in a way I was even interested in seeing a trial. I'd never had the chance before. Yeah, said the other policeman, but it gets a little boring after a while. A short time later, a small bell rang in the room. Then they took my handcuffs off. They opened the door and led me into the dock. The room was packed. Despite the blinds, the sun filtered through in places and the air was already stifling. They hadn't opened the windows. I sat down with the policemen standing on either side of me. It was then that I noticed a row of faces in front of me. They were all looking at me. I realized that they were the jury. But I can't say what distinguished one from another. I had just one impression. I was sitting across from a row of seats on a streetcar, and all these anonymous passengers were looking over the new arrival to see if they could find something funny about him. I knew it was a silly idea since it wasn't anything funny they were after but a crime. There isn't much difference, though. In any case... That was the idea that came to me. I was feeling a little dizzy, too, with all those people in that stuffy room. I looked around the courtroom again, but I couldn't make out a single face. I think that at first I hadn't realized that all those people were crowding in to see me. Usually people didn't pay much attention to me. It took some doing on my part to understand that I was the cause of all the excitement. I said to the policeman, 
some crowd. He told me it was because of the press, and he pointed to a group of men at a table just below the jury box. He said, that's them. I asked, who? And he repeated, the press. He knew one of the reporters, who just then spotted him and was making his way toward us. He was an older, friendly man with a twisted little grin on his face. He gave the policeman a warm handshake. I noticed then that everyone was waving and exchanging greetings and talking, as if they were in a club where people are glad to find themselves among others from the same world. That is how I explained to myself the strange impression I had of being odd man out, a kind of intruder. Yet the reporter turned and spoke to me with a smile. He told me that he hoped everything would go well for me. I thanked him, and he added, You know, we've blown your case up a little. Summer is the slow season for the news, and your story and the parricide were the only ones worth bothering about. Then he pointed in the direction of the group he had just left, at a little man who looked like a fattened-up weasel. He told me that the man was a special correspondent for a Paris paper. Actually, he didn't come because of you, but since they assigned him to cover the parricide trial, they asked him to send a dispatch about your case at the same time. And again, I almost thanked him. But I thought that that would be ridiculous. He waved cordially, shyly, and left us. We waited a few more minutes. My lawyer arrived, in his gown, surrounded by lots of colleagues. He walked over to the reporters and shook some hands. They joked and laughed and looked completely at ease, until the moment when the bell in the court rang. Everyone went back to his place. My lawyer walked over to me, shook my hand, and advised me to respond briefly to the questions that would be put to me, not to volunteer anything, and to leave the rest to him. To my left I heard the sound of a chair being pulled out, and I saw a tall, thin man, dressed in red, and wearing a pince-nez, who was carefully folding his robe as he sat down. A bailiff said, All rise. At the same time, two large fans started to whir, Three judges, two in black, the third in red, entered with files in hand and walked briskly to the rostrum, which dominated the room. The man in the red gown sat on the chair in the middle, set his cap down in front of him, wiped his bald little head with a handkerchief, and announced that the court was now in session. The reporters already had their pens in hand. They all had the same indifferent and somewhat snide look on their faces. One of them, however much younger than the others, wearing gray flannels and a blue tie, had left his pen lying in front of him and was looking at me. All I could see in his slightly lopsided face were his two very bright eyes, which were examining me closely, without betraying any definable emotion. And I had the odd impression of being watched by myself. Maybe it was for that reason, and also because I wasn't familiar with all the procedures, that I didn't quite understand everything that happened next. The drawing of lots for the jury. The questions put by the presiding judge to my lawyer, the prosecutor, and the jury. Each time, the jurors' heads would all turn toward the bench at the same time. The quick reading of the indictment, in which I recognized names of people and places, and some more questions to my lawyer. Anyway, the presiding judge said he was going to proceed with the calling of witnesses. The bailiff read off some names that caught my attention. In the middle of what until then had been a shapeless mass of spectators, I saw them stand up one by one, only to disappear again through a side door. The director and the caretaker from the home, old Thomas Perez, Raymond, Masson, Salamano, and Marie. She waved to me, anxiously. I was still feeling surprised that I hadn't seen them before when Celeste, the last to be called, stood up. I recognized next to him the little woman from the restaurant, with her jacket and her stiff and determined manner. She was staring right at me. But I didn't have time to think about them because the presiding judge started speaking. He said that the formal proceedings were about to begin and that he didn't think he needed to remind the public to remain silent. According to him, he was there to conduct, in an impartial manner, the proceedings of a case which he would consider objectively. 
The verdict returned by the jury would be taken in a spirit of justice, and in any event he would have the courtroom cleared at the slightest disturbance. It was getting hotter, and I could see the people in the courtroom fanning themselves with newspapers, which made a continuous low rustling sound. The presiding judge gave a signal, and the bailiff brought over three fans made of woven straw, which the three judges started waving immediately. My examination began right away. The presiding judge questioned me calmly and even, it seemed to me, with a hint of cordiality. Once again he had me state my name, age, date, and place of birth, and although it irritated me, I realized it was only natural because it would be a very serious thing to try the wrong man. Then he reread the narrative of what I'd done, turning to me every few sentences to ask, Is that correct? Each time I answered, Yes, Your Honor, as my lawyer had instructed me to do. It took a long time because the judge went into minute detail in his narrative. The reporters were writing the whole time. I was conscious of being watched by the youngest of them and by the little robot woman. Every one of the row of streetcar seats was turned directly toward the judge, who coughed, leafed through his file, and turned toward me, fanning himself. He told me that he now had to turn to some questions that might seem irrelevant to my case, but might in fact have a significant bearing on it. I knew right away he was going to talk about Mama again, and at the same time I could feel how much it irritated me. He asked me why I had put Mama in the home. I answered that it was because I didn't have the money to have her looked after and cared for. He asked me if it had been hard on me, and I answered that Mama and I didn't expect anything from each other anymore, or from anyone else either, and that we had both gotten used to our new lives. The judge then said that he didn't want to dwell on this point, and he asked the prosecutor if he had any further questions. The prosecutor had his back half turned to me, and without looking at me, he stated that with the court's permission, he would like to know whether I had gone back to the spring by myself intending to kill the Arab. No, I said. Well then, why was I armed, and why did I return to precisely that spot? I said it just happened that way. And the prosecutor noted in a nasty voice, that will be all for now. After that, things got a little confused, at least for me. But after some conferring, the judge announced that the hearing was adjourned until the afternoon, at which time the witnesses would be heard. I didn't even have time to think. I was taken out, put into the van, and driven to the prison, where I had something to eat. After a very short time, just long enough for me to realize I was tired, they came back for me. The whole thing started again, and I found myself in the same courtroom in front of the same faces. Only, it was much hotter. And, as if by some miracle, each member of the jury, the prosecutor, my lawyer, and some of the reporters, too, had been provided with straw fans. The young reporter and the little robot woman were still there. They weren't fanning themselves, but they were still watching me without saying a word. I wiped away the sweat covering my face, and I had barely become aware of where I was and what I was doing when I heard the director of the home being called. He was asked whether Mama ever complained about me, and he said yes, but that some of it was just a way the residents all had of complaining about their relatives. The judge had him clarify whether she used to reproach me for having put her in the home, and the director again said yes, but this time he didn't add anything else. To another question he replied that he had been surprised by my calm the day of the funeral. He was asked what he meant by calm. The director then looked down at the tips of his shoes and said that I hadn't wanted to see Mama, that I hadn't cried once, and that I had left right after the funeral without paying my last respects at her grave. And one other thing had surprised him. One of the men who worked for the undertaker had told him I didn't know how old Mama was. There was a brief silence, and then the judge asked him if he was sure I was the man he had just been speaking of. The director didn't understand the question, so the judge told him, It's a formality. 
He then asked the prosecutor if he had any questions to put to the witness, and the prosecutor exclaimed, Oh, no, that is quite sufficient, with such glee, and with such a triumphant look in my direction, that for the first time in years I had this stupid urge to cry, because I could feel how much all these people hated me. After asking the jury and my lawyer if they had any questions, the judge called the caretaker. The same ritual was repeated for him as for all the others. As he took the stand, the caretaker glanced at me and then looked away. He answered the questions put to him. He said I hadn't wanted to see Mama, that I had smoked and slept some, and that I had had some coffee. It was then I felt a stirring go through the room, and for the first time I realized that I was guilty. The caretaker was asked to repeat the part about the coffee and the cigarette. The prosecutor looked at me with an ironic gleam in his eye. At that point, my lawyer asked the caretaker if it wasn't true that he had smoked a cigarette with me. But the prosecutor objected vehemently to this question. Who is on trial here? And what kind of tactics are these? Trying to taint the witnesses for the prosecution in an effort to detract from testimony that remains nonetheless overwhelming? In spite of all that... The judge directed the caretaker to answer the question. The old man looked embarrassed and said, I know I was wrong to do it, but I couldn't refuse the cigarette when Monsieur offered it to me. Lastly, I was asked if I had anything to add. Nothing, I said, except that the witness is right. It's true. I did offer him a cigarette. The caretaker gave me a surprised and somehow grateful look. He hesitated, and then he said that he was the one who offered me the coffee. My lawyer was exultant and stated loudly that the jury would take note of the fact. But the prosecutor shouted over our heads and said, Indeed, the gentlemen of the jury will take note of the fact, and they will conclude that a stranger may offer a cup of coffee, but that beside the body of the one who brought him into the world... A son should have refused it. The caretaker went back to his bench. When Thomas Perez's turn came, a bailiff had to hold him up and help him get to the witness stand. Perez said it was really my mother he had known and that he had seen me only once, on the day of the funeral. He was asked how I had acted that day, and he replied, You understand, I was too sad, so I didn't see anything. My sadness made it impossible to see anything, because for me it was a very great sadness, and I even fainted, so I wasn't able to see Monsieur. The prosecutor asked him if he had at least seen me cry. Perez answered no. The prosecutor in turn said, The gentlemen of the jury will take note. But my lawyer got angry. He asked Perez, in what seemed to be an exaggerated tone of voice, if he had seen me not cry. Perez said no. The spectators laughed. And my lawyer, rolling up one of his sleeves, said with finality, Here we have the perfect reflection of this entire trial. Everything is true and nothing is true. The prosecutor had a blank expression on his face and with a pencil he was poking holes in the title page of his case file. After a five-minute recess, during which my lawyer told me that everything was working out for the best, we heard the testimony of Celeste, who was called by the defense. The defense meant me. Every now and then Celeste would glance over in my direction and rotate his Panama hat in his hands. He was wearing the new suit he used to put on to go out with me to the races sometimes on Sundays but I think he must not have been able to get his collar on because he only had a brass stud keeping his shirt fastened. He was asked if I was a customer of his, and he said yes, but he was also a friend. What he thought of me, and he answered that I was a man. What he meant by that, and he stated that everybody knew what that meant. If he had noticed that I was ever withdrawn, and all he would admit was that I didn't speak unless I had something to say. The prosecutor asked him if I kept up with my bill. Celeste laughed and said, Between us, those were just details. He was again asked what he thought about my crime. 
He put his hands on the edge of the box, and you could tell he had something prepared. He said, The way I see it, it's bad luck. Everybody knows what bad luck is. It leaves you defenseless. And there it is. The way I see it, it's bad luck. He was about to go on, but the judge told him that that would be all and thanked him. Celeste was a little taken aback, but he stated that he had more to say. He was asked to be brief. He again repeated that it was bad luck. And the judge said, yes, fine, but we are here to judge just this sort of bad luck. Thank you. And as if he had reached the end of both his knowledge and his goodwill, Celeste then turned toward me. It looked to me as if his eyes were glistening and his lips were trembling. He seemed to be asking me what else he could do. I said nothing. I made no gesture of any kind, but it was the first time in my life I ever wanted to kiss a man. The judge again instructed him to step down. Celeste went and sat among the spectators. He sat there throughout the entire trial, leaning forward, his elbows on his knees, the Panama hat in his hands, listening to everything that was said. Marie entered. She had put on a hat, and she was still beautiful. But I liked her better with her hair loose. From where I was sitting, I could just make out the slight fullness of her breasts, and I recognized the little pout of her lower lip. She seemed very nervous. Right away she was asked how long she had known me. She said since the time she worked in our office. The judge wanted to know what her relation to me was. She said she was my friend. To another question, she answered yes, it was true that she was supposed to marry me. Flipping through a file, the prosecutor asked her bluntly when our liaison had begun. She indicated the date. The prosecutor remarked indifferently that if he was not mistaken, that was the day after Mama died. Then, in a slightly ironic tone, he said that he didn't mean to dwell on such a delicate matter, and that he fully appreciated Marie's misgivings, but, and here his tone grew firmer, that he was duty-bound to go beyond propriety. So he asked Marie to describe briefly that day when I had first known her. Marie didn't want to, but at the prosecutor's insistence, she went over our swim, the movies, and going back to my place. The prosecutor said that after Marie had given her statements to the examining magistrate, he had consulted the movie listings for that day. He added that Marie herself would tell the court what film was showing. In an almost expressionless voice, she did in fact tell the court that it was a Fernandel film. By the time she had finished, there was complete silence in the courtroom. The prosecutor then rose, and very gravely and with what struck me as real emotion in his voice, his finger pointing at me said slowly and distinctly, Gentlemen of the jury, the day after his mother's death, this man was out swimming, starting up a dubious liaison, and going to the movies, a comedy, for laughs. I have nothing further to say. He sat down in the still silent courtroom. But all of a sudden Marie began to sob, saying it wasn't like that, there was more to it, and that she was being made to say the opposite of what she was thinking, that she knew me and I hadn't done anything wrong. But at a signal from the judge, the bailiff ushered her out, and the trial proceeded. Hardly anyone listened after that, when Masson testified that I was an honest man, and I'd even say a decent one. Hardly anyone listened to Salamano either, when he recalled how I had been good to his dog, and when he answered a question about my mother and me by saying that I had run out of things to say to Mamma, and that was why I'd put her in the home. You must understand, Salamano kept saying, you must understand. But no one seemed to understand. He was ushered out. Next came Raymond, who was the last witness. He waved to me, and all of a sudden, he blurted out that I was innocent. But the judge advised him that he was being asked not for judgments, but for facts. He was instructed to wait for the questions before responding. 
He was directed to state precisely what his relations with the victim were. Raymond took this opportunity to say that he was the one the victim hated ever since he had hit the guy's sister. Nevertheless, the judge asked him whether the victim hadn't also had reason to hate me. Raymond said that my being at the beach was just chance. The prosecutor then asked him how it was that the letter that set the whole drama in motion had been written by me. Raymond responded that it was just chance. The prosecutor retorted that chance already had a lot of misdeeds on its conscience in this case. He wanted to know if it was just by chance that I hadn't intervened when Raymond had beaten up his girlfriend. Just by chance that I had acted as a witness at the police station. And again, just by chance that my statements on that occasion had proved to be so convenient. Finishing up, he asked Raymond how he made his living. And when Raymond replied, warehouse guard, the prosecutor informed the jury that it was common knowledge that the witness practiced the profession of procurer. I was his friend and accomplice. They had before them the basest of crimes, a crime made worse than sordid by the fact that they were dealing with a monster, a man without morals. Raymond wanted to defend himself, and my lawyer objected, but they were instructed that they must let the prosecutor finish. I have little to add, the prosecutor said. Was he your friend? he asked Raymond. Yes, Raymond said. We were pals. The prosecutor then put the same question to me, and I looked at Raymond, who returned my gaze. I answered yes. The prosecutor then turned to the jury and declared, The same man who the day after his mother died was indulging in the most shameful debauchery, killed a man for the most trivial of reasons, and did so in order to settle an affair of unspeakable vice. He then sat down. But my lawyer had lost his patience, and raising his hand so high that his sleeves fell, revealing the creases of a starched shirt, he shouted, Come now, is my client on trial for burying his mother or for killing a man? The spectators laughed. But the prosecutor rose to his feet again, adjusted his robe, and declared that only someone with the naivete of his esteemed colleague could fail to appreciate that between these two sets of facts there existed a profound, fundamental, and tragic relationship. Indeed, he loudly exclaimed, I accuse this man of burying his mother with crime in his heart. This pronouncement seemed to have a strong effect on the people in the courtroom. My lawyer shrugged his shoulders and wiped the sweat from his brow, but he looked shaken himself, and I realized that things weren't going well for me. The trial was adjourned. As I was leaving the courthouse on my way back to the van, I recognized for a brief moment the smell and color of the summer evening. In the darkness of my mobile prison, I could make out one by one, as if from the depths of my exhaustion, all the familiar sounds of a town I loved and of a certain time of day when I used to feel happy. The cries of the newspaper vendors in the already languid air, the last few birds in the square, the shouts of the sandwich sellers, the screech of the streetcars turning sharply through the upper town, and that hum in the sky before night engulfs the port. All this mapped out for me a route I knew so well before going to prison, and which now I traveled blind. Yes, it was the hour when, a long time ago, I was perfectly content. What awaited me back then was always a night of easy, dreamless sleep. And yet something had changed, since it was back to my cell that I went to wait for the next day. As if familiar paths traced in summer skies could lead as easily to prison as to the sleep of the innocent. Chapter 4 even in the prisoner's dock, it's always interesting to hear people talk about you. And during the summations by the prosecutor and my lawyer, there was a lot said about me. Maybe more about me than about my crime. 
But were their two speeches so different after all? My lawyer raised his arms and pleaded guilty, but with an explanation. The prosecutor waved his hands and proclaimed my guilt, but without an explanation. One thing bothered me a little, though. Despite everything that was on my mind, I felt like intervening every now and then, but my lawyer kept telling me just keep quiet, it won't do your case any good. In a way, they seemed to be arguing the case as if it had nothing to do with me. Everything was happening without my participation. My fate was being decided without anyone so much as asking my opinion. There were times when I felt like breaking in on all of them and saying, Wait a minute, who's the accused here? Being the accused counts for something, and I have something to say. But on second thought, I didn't have anything to say. Besides... I have to admit that whatever interest you can get people to take in you doesn't last very long. For example, I got bored very quickly with the prosecutor's speech. Only bits and pieces, a gesture or a long but isolated tirade, caught my attention or aroused my interest. The gist of what he was saying, if I understood him correctly, was that my crime was premeditated. At least, that is what he tried to show. As he himself said, I will prove it to you, gentlemen, and I will prove it in two ways. First, in the blinding clarity of the facts, and second, in the dim light cast by the mind of this criminal soul. He reminded the court of my insensitivity, of my ignorance when asked Mama's age, of my swim the next day with a woman, of the Fernandel movie, and finally of my taking Marie home with me. It took me a few minutes to understand the last part because he kept saying his mistress, and to me she was Marie. Then he came to the business with Raymond. I thought his way of viewing the events had a certain consistency. What he was saying was plausible. I had agreed with Raymond to write the letter in order to lure his mistress and submit her to mistreatment by a man of doubtful morality. I had provoked Raymond's adversaries at the beach. Raymond had been wounded. I had asked him to give me his gun. I had gone back alone intending to use it. I had shot the Arab as I planned. I had waited. And to make sure I had done the job right, I fired four more shots, calmly, point-blank, thoughtfully as it were. And there you have it, gentlemen, said the prosecutor. I have retraced for you the course of events which led this man to kill with full knowledge of his actions. I stress this point, he said, for this is no ordinary murder, no thoughtless act for which you might find mitigating circumstances. This man, gentlemen, this man is intelligent. You heard him, didn't you? He knows how to answer. He knows the value of words and no one can say that he acted without realizing what he was doing. I was listening, and I could hear that I was being judged intelligent, but I couldn't quite understand how an ordinary man's good qualities could become crushing accusations against a guilty man. At least that was what struck me, and I stopped listening to the prosecutor until I heard him say, "'Has he so much as expressed any remorse?' Never, gentlemen. Not once during the preliminary hearings did this man show emotion over his heinous offense. At that point he turned in my direction, pointed his finger at me, and went on attacking me without my ever really understanding why. Of course, I couldn't help admitting that he was right. I didn't feel much remorse for what I'd done, but I was surprised by how relentless he was. I would have liked to have tried explaining to him cordially— almost affectionately, that I had never been able to truly feel remorse for anything. My mind was always on what was coming next, today or tomorrow. But naturally, given the position I'd been put in, I couldn't talk to anyone in that way. I didn't have the right to show any feeling or goodwill. And I tried to listen again, because the prosecutor started talking about my soul. He said that he had peered into it and that he had found nothing, gentlemen of the jury. He said the truth was that I didn't have a soul and that nothing human, 
not one of the moral principles that govern men's hearts was within my reach. Of course, he added, we cannot blame him for this. We cannot complain that he lacks what it was not in his power to acquire. But here in this court, the holy negative virtue of tolerance must give way to the sterner but loftier virtue of justice, especially when the emptiness of a man's heart becomes, as we find it has in this man, an abyss threatening to swallow up society. It was then that he talked about my attitude toward Maman. He repeated what he had said earlier in the proceedings. But it went on much longer than when he was talking about my crime, so long, in fact, that finally all I was aware of was how hot a morning it was. At least until the prosecutor stopped, and after a short silence, continued in a very low voice filled with conviction. Tomorrow, gentlemen... This same court is to sit in judgment of the most monstrous of crimes, the murder of a father. According to him, the imagination recoiled before such an odious offense. He went so far as to hope that human justice would mete out punishment unflinchingly. But he wasn't afraid to say it. My callousness inspired in him a horror nearly greater than that which he felt at the crime of parricide. And also, according to him, a man who is morally guilty of killing his mother severs himself from society in the same way as the man who raises a murderous hand against the father who begat him. In any case, the one man paved the way for the deeds of the other, in a sense foreshadowed and even legitimized them. I am convinced, gentlemen, he added, raising his voice, that you will not think it too bold of me if I suggest to you that the man who is seated in the dock is also guilty of the murder to be tried in this court tomorrow. He must be punished accordingly. Here the prosecutor wiped his face, which was glistening with sweat. He concluded by saying that his duty was a painful one, but that he would carry it out resolutely. He stated that I had no place in a society whose most fundamental rules I ignored and that I could not appeal to the same human heart whose elementary response I knew nothing of. I ask you for this man's head, he said, and I do so with a heart at ease. For if in the course of what has been a long career I have had occasion to call for the death penalty... Never as strongly as today have I felt this painful duty made easier, lighter, clearer by the certain knowledge of a sacred imperative, and by the horror I feel when I look into a man's face and all I see is a monster. When the prosecutor returned to his seat, there was a rather long silence. My head was spinning with heat and astonishment. The presiding judge cleared his throat and in a very low voice asked me if I had anything to add. I stood up, and since I did wish to speak, I said, almost at random, in fact, that I never intended to kill the Arab. The judge replied by saying that at least that was an assertion, that until then he hadn't quite grasped the nature of my defense, and that before hearing from my lawyer he would be happy to have me state precisely the motives for my act. Fumbling a little with my words and realizing how ridiculous I sounded, I blurted out that it was because of the sun. People laughed. My lawyer threw up his hands, and immediately after that he was given the floor. But he stated that it was late, and that he would need several hours. He requested that the trial be reconvened in the afternoon. The court granted his motion. That afternoon, the big fans were still churning the thick air in the courtroom, and the jurors' brightly colored fans were all moving in unison. It seemed to me as if my lawyer's summation would never end. At one point, though, I listened, because he was saying, It is true, I killed a man. He went on like that, saying I, whenever he was speaking about me. I was completely taken aback. I leaned over to one of the guards and asked him why he was doing that. He told me to keep quiet, and a few seconds later he added, All lawyers do it. I thought it was a way to exclude me even further from the case, reduce me to nothing, and, in a sense, substitute himself for me. But I think I was already very far removed from that courtroom. 
Besides, my lawyer seemed ridiculous to me. He rushed through a plea of provocation, and then he too talked about my soul. But to me he seemed to be a lot less talented than the prosecutor. I too, he said, have peered into this man's soul. But unlike the esteemed representative of the government prosecutor's office, I did see something there. And I can assure you that I read it like an open book. What he read was that I was an honest man, a steadily employed, tireless worker, loyal to the firm that employed him, well-liked, and sympathetic to the misfortunes of others. To him, I was a model son who had supported his mother as long as he could. In the end, I had hoped that a home for the aged would give the old woman the comfort that with my limited means I could not provide for her. Gentlemen, he added, I am amazed that so much has been made of this home. For after all, if it were necessary to prove the usefulness and importance of such institutions, all one would have to say is that it is the state itself which subsidizes them. The only thing is, he didn't say anything about the funeral, and I thought that that was a glaring omission in his summation. But all the long speeches, all the interminable days and hours that people had spent talking about my soul had left me with the impression of a colorless, swirling river that was making me dizzy. In the end, all I remember is that while my lawyer went on talking, I could hear through the expanse of chambers and courtrooms an ice cream vendor blowing his tin trumpet out in the street. I was assailed by memories of a life that wasn't mine anymore, but one in which I'd found the simplest and most lasting joys. The smells of summer, the part of town I loved, a certain evening sky, Marie's dresses and the way she laughed. The utter pointlessness of whatever I was doing there seized me by the throat, and all I wanted was to get it over with and get back to my cell and sleep. I barely even heard when my lawyer, wrapping up, exclaimed that the jury surely would not send an honest, hard-working man to his death because he had lost control of himself for one moment, and then he asked them to find extenuating circumstances for a crime for which I was already suffering the most agonizing of punishments, eternal remorse. Court was adjourned, and my lawyer sat back down. He looked exhausted but his colleagues came over to shake his hand. I heard that was brilliant. One of them even appealed to me as a witness. Wasn't it? he said. I agreed, but my congratulations weren't sincere, because I was too tired. Meanwhile, the sun was getting low outside, and it wasn't as hot anymore. From what street noises I could hear, I sensed the sweetness of evening coming on. There we all were, waiting, and what we were all waiting for really concerned only me. I looked around the room again. Everything was the same as it had been the first day. My eyes met those of the little robot woman and the reporter in the gray jacket. That reminded me that I hadn't tried to catch Marie's eye once during the whole trial. I hadn't forgotten about her. I just had too much to do. I saw her sitting between Celeste and Raymond. She made a little gesture as if to say, at last. There was a worried little smile on her face, but my heart felt nothing, and I couldn't even return her smile. The judges came back in. Very quickly a series of questions was read to the jury. I heard, guilty of murder, premeditated, extenuating circumstances. The jurors filed out, and I was taken to the little room where I had waited before. My lawyer joined me. He was very talkative and spoke to me more confidently and cordially than he ever had before. He thought that everything would go well and that I would get off with a few years in prison or at hard labor. I asked him whether he thought there was any chance of overturning the verdict if it was unfavorable. He said no. His tactic had been not to file any motions so as not to antagonize the jury. He explained to me that verdicts weren't set aside just like that for nothing. That seemed obvious, and I accepted his logic. Looking at it objectively, it made perfect sense. Otherwise, there would be too much pointless paperwork. 
Anyway, he said, we can always appeal, but I'm convinced that the outcome will be favorable. We waited a long time, almost three quarters of an hour, I think. Then a bell rang. My lawyer left me, saying, The foreman of the jury is going to announce the verdict. You'll only be brought in for the passing of sentence. Door slammed. People were running on stairs somewhere, but I couldn't tell if they were nearby or far away. Then I heard a muffled voice reading something in the courtroom. When the bell rang again, when the door to the dock opened, what rose to meet me was the silence in the courtroom. Silence and the strange feeling I had when I noticed that the young reporter had turned his eyes away. I didn't look in Marie's direction. I didn't have time to. Because the presiding judge told me in bizarre language that I was to have my head cut off in a public square in the name of the French people. Then it seemed to me that I suddenly knew what was on everybody's face. It was a look of consideration, I'm sure. The policemen were very gentle with me. The lawyer put his hand on my wrist. I wasn't thinking about anything anymore. But the presiding judge asked me if I had anything to say. I thought about it. I said no. That's when they took me away. Chapter 5 For the third time I've refused to see the chaplain. I don't have anything to say to him, I don't feel like talking, and I'll be seeing him soon enough as it is. All I care about right now is escaping the machinery of justice, seeing if there's any way out of the inevitable. They put me in a different cell. From this one, when I'm stretched out on my bunk, I see the sky, and that's all I see. I spend my days watching how the dwindling of color turns day into night. Lying here, I put my hands behind my head and wait. I can't count the times I've wondered if there have ever been any instances of condemned men escaping the relentless machinery, disappearing before the execution, or breaking through the cordon of police. Then I blame myself every time for not having paid enough attention to accounts of executions. A man should always take an interest in those things. You never know what might happen. I'd read stories in the papers like everybody else, but there must have been books devoted to the subject that I'd never been curious enough to look into. Maybe I would have found some accounts of escapes in them. I might have discovered that, in at least one instance, the wheel had stopped, that in spite of all the unrelenting calculation, chance and luck had at least once changed something. Just once. In a way, I think that would have been enough. My heart would have taken over from there. The papers were always talking about the debt owed to society. According to them, it had to be paid. But that doesn't speak to the imagination. What really counted was the possibility of escape, a leap to freedom, out of the implacable ritual, a wild run for it that would give whatever chance for hope there was. Of course, hope meant being cut down on some street corner as you ran like mad from a random bullet. But when I really thought it through, nothing was going to allow me such a luxury. Everything was against it. I would just be caught up in the machinery again. Despite my willingness to understand, I just couldn't accept such arrogant certainty. Because, after all, there really was something ridiculously out of proportion between the verdict such certainty was based on and the imperturbable march of events from the moment the verdict was announced. The fact that the sentence had been read at eight o'clock at night and not at five o'clock. The fact that it could have been an entirely different one. The fact that it had been decided by men who changed their underwear. The fact that it had been handed down in the name of some vague notion called the French or German or Chinese people. All of it seemed to detract from the seriousness of the decision. I was forced to admit, however, that from the moment it had been passed, its consequences became as real and as serious as the wall against which I pressed the length of my body. At times like this I remembered a story Mama used to tell me about my father. I never knew him. Maybe the only thing I did know about the man was the story Mama would tell me back then. 
He'd gone to watch a murderer be executed. Just the thought of going had made him sick to his stomach, but he went anyway, and when he came back he spent half the morning throwing up. I remember feeling a little disgusted by him at the time. But now I understood. It was perfectly normal. How had I not seen that there was nothing more important than an execution, and that when you come right down to it, it was the only thing a man could truly be interested in? If I ever got out of this prison, I would go and watch every execution there was. But I think it was a mistake even to consider the possibility, because at the thought that one fine morning I would find myself a free man standing behind a cordon of police, on the outside as it were, at the thought of being the spectator who comes to watch and then can go and throw up afterwards, a wave of poisoned joy rose in my throat. But I wasn't being reasonable. It was a mistake to let myself get carried away by such imaginings, because the next minute I would get so cold that I would curl up into a ball under my blanket and my teeth would be chattering and I couldn't make them stop. But naturally you can't always be reasonable. At other times, for instance, I would make up new laws. I would reform the penal code. I'd realized that the most important thing was to give the condemned man a chance. Even one in a thousand was good enough to set things right. So it seemed to me that you could come up with a mixture of chemicals that, if ingested by the patient, that's the word I'd use, patient, would kill him nine times out of ten. But he would know this. That would be the one condition. For by giving it some hard thought, by considering the whole thing calmly, I could see that the trouble with the guillotine was that you had no chance at all. Absolutely none. The fact was that it had been decided once and for all that the patient was to die. It was an open and shut case, a fixed arrangement, a tacit agreement that there was no question of going back on. If by some extraordinary chance the blade failed, they would just start over. So the thing that bothered me most was that the condemned man had to hope the machine would work the first time. And I say that's wrong. And in a way I was right. But in another way I was forced to admit that that was the whole secret of good organization. In other words, the condemned man was forced into a kind of moral collaboration. It was in his interest that everything go off without a hitch. I was also made to see that until that moment I'd had mistaken ideas about these things. For a long time I believed, and I don't know why, that to get to the guillotine you had to climb stairs onto a scaffold. I think it was because of the French Revolution. I mean, because of everything I'd been taught or shown about it. But one morning I remembered seeing a photograph that appeared in the papers at the time of a much-talked-about execution. In reality, the machine was set up right on the ground, as simple as you please. It was much narrower than I'd thought. It was funny I'd never noticed that before. I'd been struck by this picture because the guillotine looked like such a precision instrument, perfect and gleaming. You always get exaggerated notions of things you don't know anything about. I was made to see that contrary to what I thought, everything was very simple. The guillotine is on the same level as the man approaching it. He walks up to it the way you walk up to another person. That bothered me too. Mounting the scaffold, going right up into the sky, was something the imagination could hold on to. Whereas, once again... The machine destroyed everything. You were killed discreetly, with a little shame, and with great precision. There were two other things I was always thinking about. The dawn and my appeal. I would reason with myself, though, and try not to think about them any more. I would stretch out, look at the sky, and force myself to find something interesting about it. It would turn green. That was evening. I would make another effort to divert my thoughts. I would listen to my heartbeat. I couldn't imagine that this sound which had been with me for so long could ever stop. I've never really had much of an imagination, but still I would try to picture the exact moment when the beating of my heart 
would no longer be going on inside my head. But it was no use. The dawn, or my appeal, would still be there. I would end up telling myself that the most rational thing was not to hold myself back. They always came at dawn, I knew that, and so I spent my nights waiting for that dawn. I've never liked being surprised. If something is going to happen to me, I want to be there. That's why I ended up sleeping only a little bit during the day, and then, all night long, waited patiently for the first light to show on the pane of sky. The hardest time was that uncertain hour when I knew they usually set to work. After midnight, I would wait and watch. My ears had never heard so many noises or picked up such small sounds. One thing I can say, though, is that in a certain way I was lucky that whole time, since I never heard footsteps. Mama used to say that you can always find something to be happy about. In my prison, when the sky turned red and a new day slipped into my cell, I found out that she was right, because I might just as easily have heard footsteps and my heart could have burst. Even though I would rush to the door at the slightest shuffle, even though, with my ear pressed to the wood, I would wait frantically until I heard the sound of my own breathing, terrified to find it so hoarse, like a dog's panting. My heart would not burst after all, and I would have gained another twenty-four hours. All day long there was the thought of my appeal. I think I got everything out of it that I could. I would assess my holdings and get the maximum return on my thoughts. I would always begin by assuming the worst. My appeal was denied. Well, so I'm going to die. Sooner than other people will, obviously. But everybody knows life isn't worth living. Deep down I knew perfectly well that it doesn't much matter whether you die at thirty or at seventy, since in either case other men and women will naturally go on living, and for thousands of years. In fact, nothing could be clearer. Whether it was now or twenty years from now, I would still be the one dying. At that point, what would disturb my train of thought was the terrifying leap I would feel my heart take at the idea of having twenty more years of life ahead of me. But I simply had to stifle it by imagining what I'd be thinking in twenty years when it would all come down to the same thing anyway. Since we're all going to die, it's obvious that when and how don't matter. Therefore, and the difficult thing was not to lose sight of all the reasoning that went into this therefore, I had to accept the rejection of my appeal. Then, and only then, would I have the right, so to speak, would I give myself permission, as it were, to consider the alternative hypothesis. I was pardoned. The trouble was that I would somehow have to cool the hot blood that would suddenly surge through my body and sting my eyes with a delirious joy. It would take all my strength to quiet my heart, to be rational. In order to make my resignation to the first hypothesis more plausible, I had to be level-headed about this one as well. If I succeeded, I gained an hour of calm. That was something anyway. It was at one such moment that I once again refused to see the chaplain. I was lying down, and I could tell from the golden glow in the sky that evening was coming on. I had just denied my appeal, and I could feel the steady pulse of my blood circulating inside me. I didn't need to see the chaplain. For the first time in a long time I thought about Marie. The days had been long since she'd stopped writing— that evening I thought about it and told myself that maybe she had gotten tired of being the girlfriend of a condemned man. It also occurred to me that maybe she was sick, or dead. These things happen. How was I to know, since apart from our two bodies, now separated, there wasn't anything to keep us together, or even to remind us of each other? Anyway, after that, remembering Marie meant nothing to me. I wasn't interested in her dead. That seemed perfectly normal to me, since I understood very well that people would forget me when I was dead. They wouldn't have anything more to do with me. I wasn't even able to tell myself that it was hard to think those things. 
It was at that exact moment that the chaplain came in. When I saw him, I felt a little shudder go through me. He noticed it and told me not to be afraid. I told him that it wasn't his usual time. He replied that it was just a friendly visit and had nothing to do with my appeal, which he knew nothing about. He sat down on my bunk and invited me to sit next to him. I refused. All the same, there was something very gentle about him. He sat there for a few seconds, leaning forward with his elbows on his knees, looking at his hands. They were slender and sinewy, and they reminded me of two nimble animals. He slowly rubbed one against the other. Then he sat there, leaning forward like that, for so long that for an instant I seemed to forget he was there. But suddenly he raised his head and looked straight at me. Why have you refused to see me? he asked. I said that I didn't believe in God. He wanted to know if I was sure, and I said that I didn't see any reason to ask myself that question. It seemed unimportant. He then leaned back against the wall, hands flat on his thighs. Almost as if it wasn't me he was talking to, he remarked that sometimes we think we're sure when in fact we're not. I didn't say anything. He looked at me and asked, what do you think? I said it was possible. In any case, I may not have been sure about what really did interest me, but I was absolutely sure about what didn't. And it just so happened that what he was talking about didn't interest me. He looked away and without moving asked me if I wasn't talking that way out of extreme despair. I explained to him that I wasn't desperate. I was just afraid which was only natural. Then God can help you, he said. Every man I have known in your position has turned to him. I acknowledged that that was their right. It also meant that they must have had the time for it. As for me, I didn't want anybody's help, and I just didn't have the time to interest myself in what didn't interest me. At that point he threw up his hands in annoyance, but then sat forward and smoothed out the folds of his cassock. When he had finished he started in again, addressing me as my friend. If he was talking to me this way it wasn't because I was condemned to die. The way he saw it we were all condemned to die. But I interrupted him by saying that it wasn't the same thing, and that besides it wouldn't be a consolation anyway. Certainly, he agreed. But if you don't die today, you'll die tomorrow, or the next day, and then the same question will arise. How will you face that terrifying ordeal? I said I would face it exactly as I was facing it now. At that, he stood up and looked me straight in the eye. It was a game I knew well. I played it a lot with Emmanuel and Celeste, and usually they were the ones who looked away. The chaplain knew the game well, too. I could tell right away. His gaze never faltered. And his voice didn't falter either, when he said, Have you no hope at all? And do you really live with the thought that when you die, you die, and nothing remains? Yes, I said. Then he lowered his head and sat back down. He told me that he pitied me. He thought it was more than a man could bear. I didn't feel anything except that he was beginning to annoy me. Then I turned away and went and stood under the skylight. I leaned my shoulder against the wall. Without really following what he was saying, I heard him start asking me questions again. He was talking in an agitated, urgent voice. I could see that he was genuinely upset, so I listened more closely. He was expressing his certainty that my appeal would be granted, but I was carrying the burden of a sin from which I had to free myself. According to him, human justice was nothing and divine justice was everything. I pointed out that it was the former that had condemned me. His response was that it hadn't washed away my sin for all that. I told him I didn't know what a sin was. All they had told me was that I was guilty. I was guilty, I was paying for it, and nothing more could be asked of me. At that point he stood up again 
and the thought occurred to me that in such a narrow cell, if he wanted to move around, he didn't have many options. He could either sit down or stand up. I was staring at the ground. He took a step toward me and stopped as if he didn't dare come any closer. He looked at the sky through the bars. You're wrong, my son, he said. More could be asked of you, and it may be asked. And what's that? You could be asked to see. See what? The priest gazed around my cell and answered in a voice that sounded very weary to me. Every stone here sweats with suffering. I know that. I have never looked at them without a feeling of anguish. But deep in my heart I know that the most wretched among you have seen a divine face emerge from their darkness. That is the face you are asked to see. This perked me up a little. I said I had been looking at the stones in these walls for months. There wasn't anything or anyone in the world I knew better. Maybe at one time, way back, I had searched for a face in them. But the face I was looking for was as bright as the sun and the flame of desire, and it belonged to Marie. I had searched for it in vain. Now it was all over. And in any case, I'd never seen anything emerge from any sweating stones. The chaplain looked at me with a kind of sadness. I now had my back flat against the wall, and light was streaming over my forehead. He muttered a few words I didn't catch, and abruptly asked if he could embrace me. No, I said. He turned and walked over to the wall, and slowly ran his hand over it. Do you really love this earth as much as all that? He murmured. I didn't answer. He stood there with his back to me for quite a long time. His presence was grating and oppressive. I was just about to tell him to go, to leave me alone, when all of a sudden, turning toward me, he burst out. No, I refuse to believe you. I know that at one time or another you've wished for another life. I said of course I had, but it didn't mean any more than wishing to be rich, to be able to swim faster or to have a more nicely shaped mouth. It was all the same. But he stopped me and wanted to know how I pictured this other life. Then I shouted at him, One where I could remember this life. And that's when I told him I'd had enough. He wanted to talk to me about God again, but I went up to him and made one last attempt to explain to him that I had only a little time left and I didn't want to waste it on God. He tried to change the subject by asking me why I was calling him Monsieur and not Father. That got me mad, and I told him he wasn't my father. He wasn't even on my side. Yes, my son, he said, putting his hand on my shoulder. I am on your side, but you have no way of knowing it because your heart is blind. I shall pray for you. Then, I don't know why, but something inside me snapped. I started yelling at the top of my lungs, and I insulted him and told him not to waste his prayers on me. I grabbed him by the collar of his cassock. I was pouring out on him everything that was in my heart, cries of anger and cries of joy. He seemed so certain about everything, didn't he? And yet none of his certainties was worth one hair of a woman's head. He wasn't even sure he was alive, because he was living like a dead man. Worse, it looked as if I was the one who'd come up empty-handed. But I was sure about me, about everything, surer than he could ever be, sure of my life and sure of the death I had waiting for me. Yes, that was all I had. But at least I had as much of a hold on it as it had on me. I had been right. I was still right. I was always right. I had lived my life one way, and I could just as well have lived it another. I had done this, and I hadn't done that. I hadn't done this thing, but I had done another. And so? It was as if I had waited all this time for this moment, and for the first light of this dawn to be vindicated. Nothing. Nothing mattered, and I knew why. So did he. Throughout the whole absurd life I'd lived, 
A dark wind had been rising toward me from somewhere deep in my future, across years that were still to come, and as it passed, this wind leveled whatever was offered to me at the time, in years no more real than the ones I was living. What did other people's deaths or a mother's love matter to me? What did his God or the lives people choose or the fate they think they elect matter to me when we're all elected by the same fate? Me and billions of privileged people like him who also call themselves my brothers. Couldn't he see? Couldn't he see that? Everybody was privileged. There were only privileged people. The others would all be condemned one day and he would be condemned too. What would it matter if he were accused of murder and then executed because he didn't cry at his mother's funeral? Salamano's dog was worth just as much as his wife. The little robot woman was just as guilty as the Parisian woman Masson married, or as Marie, who had wanted me to marry her. What did it matter that Raymond was as much my friend as Celeste, who was worth a lot more than him? What did it matter that Marie now offered her lips to a new Merceau? Couldn't he... Couldn't this condemned man see? And that from somewhere deep in my future. All the shouting had me gasping for air. But they were already tearing the chaplain from my grip, and the guards were threatening me. He calmed them, though, and looked at me for a moment without saying anything. His eyes were full of tears. Then he turned and disappeared. With him gone, I was able to calm down again. I was exhausted and threw myself on my bunk. I must have fallen asleep because I woke up with the stars in my face. Sounds of the countryside were drifting in. Smells of night, earth, and salt air were cooling my temples. The wondrous peace of that sleeping summer flowed through me like a tide. Then, in the dark hour before dawn, sirens blasted. They were announcing departures for a world that now and forever meant nothing to me. For the first time in a long time I thought about Maman. I felt as if I understood why, at the end of her life, she had taken a fiancé, why she had played at beginning again. Even there, in that home where lives were fading out, evening was a kind of wistful respite. So close to death, Maman must have felt free then, and ready to live it all again. Nobody. Nobody had the right to cry over her. And I felt ready to live it all again, too. As if that blind rage had washed me clean, rid me of hope. For the first time, in that night alive with signs and stars, I opened myself to the gentle indifference of the world, finding it so much like myself, so like a brother, really. I felt that I had been happy, and that I was happy again. For everything to be consummated, for me to feel less alone, I had only to wish that there be a large crowd of spectators the day of my execution, and that they greet me with cries of hate. The End You've been listening to The Stranger by Albert Camus, in a translation from the French by Matthew Ward, narrated by Jonathan Davis and directed by Greta Byram. The following is a note by Matthew Ward on his translation of this book. The stranger demanded of Camus the creation of a style at once literary and profoundly popular, an artistic sleight of hand that would make the complexities of a man's life appear simple. Despite appearances, though, neither Camus nor Merceau ever tried to make things simple for themselves. Indeed, in the mind of a moralist, simplification is tantamount to immorality, and Merceau and Camus are each moralists in their own way. What little Merceau says or feels or does resonates with all he does not say, all he does not feel, all he does not do. The simplicity of the text is merely apparent, and everywhere paradoxical. Camus acknowledged employing an American method in writing The Stranger in the first half of the book in particular. The short, precise sentences, the depiction of a character ostensibly without consciousness, and in places, the tough guy tone. Hemingway, Despasis, Faulkner, Kane, and others had pointed the way. 
There is some irony, then, in the fact that for forty years the only translation available to American audiences should be Stuart Gilbert's Britannic rendering. His is the version we have all read, the version I read as a schoolboy in the boondocks some twenty years ago. As all translators do, Gilbert gave the novel a consistency and voice all his own. A certain paraphrastic earnestness might be a way of describing his effort to make the text intelligible, to help the English-speaking reader understand what Camus meant. In addition to giving the text a more American quality, I have also attempted to venture farther into the letter of Camus' novel to capture what he said and how he said it, not what he meant. In theory, the latter should take care of itself. When Meursault meets old Salamano and his dog in the dark stairwell of their apartment house, Meursault observes, Il était avec son chien. With the reflex of a well-bred Englishman, Gilbert restores the conventional relation between man and beast and gives additional adverbial information. As usual, he had his dog with him. But I have taken Meursault at his word. He was with his dog, in the way one is with a spouse or a friend. A sentence as straightforward as this gives us the world through Meursault's eyes. As he says toward the end of his story, as he sees things, Salamano's dog was worth just as much as Salamano's wife. Such peculiarities of perception, such psychological increments of character, are Meursault. It is by pursuing what is unconventional in Camus' writing that one approaches a degree of its still startling originality. In the second half of the novel, Camus gives freer rein to a lyricism which is his alone as he takes Meursault, now stripped of his liberty, beyond sensation to enforced memory, unsatisfied desire, and finally to a kind of understanding. In this stylistic difference between the two parts, as everywhere, an impossible fidelity has been my purpose. No sentence in French literature in English translation is better known than the opening sentence of the stranger. It has become a sacred cow of sorts, and I have changed it. In his notebooks, Camus recorded the observation that the curious feeling the son has for his mother constitutes all his sensibility. And Sartre, in his Explication de l'étranger, goes out of his way to point out Meursault's use of the child's word maman when speaking of his mother. To use the more removed adult mother is, I believe, to change the nature of Meursault's curious feeling for her. It is to change his very sensibility. As Richard Howard pointed out in his classic statement on retranslation in his prefatory note to the immoralist, time reveals all translation to be paraphrase. All translations date. Certain works do not. Knowing this, and with a certain nostalgia, I bow in Stuart Gilbert's direction and ask, as Camus once did, for indulgence and understanding from the reader of this first American translation of The Stranger. That was a note by Matthew Ward on his translation of Albert Camus' The Stranger. Thank you for being a recorded book's reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.